Good morning, everyone. Welcome to CalPERS School Advisory Committee's webinar. webinar. Thank you for joining us today for the August 2021 SEAC webinar. I'm Susan Four, and along with William Greenhalgh, we'll be your host this morning. This event is being recorded. For closed captioning, please click on the link at the top of the Q&A box, or actually I put it in the chat box. Uh, before, we get the, before we begin the webinar, Bill has an update on our new SEAC platform. Go ahead, Bill. All right, hello everybody. This is Bill Greenhall. I am the host today. Um, I just wanna let you know that we heard your comments um, from the last several meetings that we wanted it more interactive. So we went, decided to go with Zoom um, during the last webinar. And for this one, we decided to open it up to where people can raise their hand and ask questions. So this is a new feature for us. Um, we have practiced and tested it. If there's any problems, um, please bear with us. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, back to you, Susan. Okay, back to you. Okay, great. Thank you, Bill. So today you'll be hearing some of the latest updates on services and programs and policies related to your work with CalPERS. The presentation will take about two and a half hours, which includes a 10 minute break. There'll also be questions, um, there'll be time for questions following each presentation and then at the general round table at the, end of, um, at the end of the webinar. Next slide, please. Okay, a few housekeeping items. As I mentioned, this is being recorded and it will be available on the CalPERS website next week. All attendees' mics are muted. And today's meeting materials are available on our CalPERS SEAC webpage. But if you have any problems locating the materials, please feel free to email the SEAC mailbox and we'll make sure to get those to you. That email is calpers underscore SEAC at calpers.ca.gov. Next slide, please. As Bill mentioned, um, in addition to submitting your question in the Q&A box, you can now use the raised hand feature. You can do this by clicking the raise hand icon at the bottom of your screen. Our host will then unmute your mic so that you can verbally ask your question. And then to lower your hand, just select lower hand. Also, please don't forget to mute your mic after you've asked your question. Next slide, please. Okay, so we've gathered several CalPERS leaders and, and team members for this event. Um, Andrea Peters will give us the legislative update. Catalina Estrada and Brad Hansen will provide a COVID update as it relates to stipends, reporting sick leave, as well as post-retirement employment. Jonathan Hensley from our financial office will provide information regarding Assembly Bill 1309. Then Brad will be back with um, an announcement of the new compensation reporting webpage. And then just before break, Veronica Silva Gill will update us on the State Social Security Administration. We'll go to a 10 minute break at that point. Next slide, please. When we return from break, Megan Corti and Ryan Beaker will update us on MyCalper system enhancements. Jennifer Raines and her special guests from CalSTRS and EdJoin will announce a new recruiting tool. And then Josh Robinson from CalPERS Stakeholder Relations will provide an update on the Education Forum, which will be coming this fall. And then finally, our senior leaders from the Employer Account Management Division, Renee Ostrander, Brad Hansen, and Christina Rollins, they will lead a question and answer session. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our first presenter, Andrea Peters. Next slide, please. Good morning, everyone. My name is Andrea Peters, and I will be providing you a quick state legislative update. Today, we will be discussing three bills, Assembly Bill 845, Senate Bill 411, and Senate Bill 634. Assembly Bill 845 
establishes COVID-19 related illnesses as a rebuttable presumption that for a disability retirement, the employee contracted COVID-19 from the work environment. This provision will automatically sunset on January 1st, 2023. For CalPERS, this bill will not change any administrative processes, nor will it alter the disability or industrial disability retirement eligibility for CalPERS members. However, this bill would provide more assurance that members who can no longer work due to contracting COVID-19 will be eligible for a disability retirement. The CalPERS board has taken a support position on this bill. Assembly Bill 845 has passed out of the California State Assembly and State Senate and was signed by the governor on July 23rd and will go into effect on January 1st, 2022. Our next bill, Senate Bill 411, removes the mandate to reinstate a retired member for violations of the working after retirement laws while, while allowing reinstatement if circumstances warrant it. This bill is similar to last year's Assembly Bill 2365. This amendment to existing law would provide CalPERS, employers, and retired members the opportunity to resolve working after retirement violations more efficiently. Reinstatement can involve significant costs to the retired member, including the loss of accrued cost of living adjustments. Rather than reinstatement, retirees could pay penalties consistent with the amount of time working in violation. This bill will not change the rules and requirements for those who work after retirement nor does it reduce CalPERS authority to impose reinstatement. It simply provides an additional option to resolve working after retirement violations. The CalPERS board has taken a support position on this bill. Senate Bill 411 has passed out of the California State Senate and State Assembly and was signed by the governor on July 23rd and will go into effect on January 1st, 2022. Our final bill, Senate Bill 634, is the Retirement Omnibus Bill that has several provisions that impact CalPERS. The first provision specifies that the membership enrollment date for optional members is the start date for the appointment if the membership election is received by CalPERS within 90 days of the start date. If the election is received after 90 days, the enrollment date would be the first day of the month in which the election is received by CalPERS. Optional members are generally local elected officials, governor appointees, and legislative employees. Existing law does not provide deadlines for this election, which is allowed for confusion with both employers and optional members. This provision provides a clear timeline to make and process these elections while providing both employers and the optional members the flexibility of a 90-day window. The second provision allows CalPERS to collect any overpayment made to or on behalf of any member, former member, or beneficiary from any future CalPERS benefit payment that may be payable. When a retiree passes, there is often an overpayment that has been paid which must be collected and reconciled with the benefits associated with the individual. When there is an ongoing benefit payment, CalPERS is usually able to reconcile the overpayment by withholding the amount from the ongoing payment. However, for lump sum payments, stress reconciliation may not always be possible. This provision gives CalPERS team members the authority to recover overpayments by withholding the amount owed from future payments, which will reduce the number of uncollected overpayments. This authority is modeled after a CalSTRS law that was enacted in 1976. The third provision conforms the paperwork process for CalPERS members electing to continue as CalPERS members in CalSTRS positions to the CalSTRS paperwork process signed into law last year. 
This amendment will not change any of the eligibility requirements related to members making this election. It simply makes conforming changes to which entities receive the election form paperwork. The final provision makes a clarifying amendment to the notification provisions of a state-funded health benefit program for the surviving spouses of specified safety officers. The amendment would clarify that CalPERS can receive notification of a safety officer's death from any reliable and verifiable source, eliminating any ambiguity that exists in current law. Senate Bill 634 has passed out of the California State Senate and State Assembly and is back on the Senate floor for a concurrent vote on amendments taken in the Assembly. This concludes my presentation. Thank you for your time, and I will now turn the presentation over to Catalina Estrada in the Employer Account Management Division. Good morning, everyone. My name is Catalina Estrada, and I'm an analyst in the Membership and Post-Retirement Employment Determination Team. Today, I'll be providing information regarding the governor's recent executive order N0821 and the impacts to our retired annuitants. Next slide, please. Um, some background on this executive order is um, on June 11th, 2021, the governor issued executive order N0821, which reinstates some of the working after retirement restrictions that were previously suspended in executive order N2520 that was issued back on March 4th, 2020. Retired annuitants, returning to work for a CalPERS covered employer on or after July 1st, 2021 will be impacted by the changes of the, this executive order. Next slide, please. Beginning with the post-retirement employment requirement that has been reinstated, this executive order has reinstated the 180 day waiting period. Under the previous executive order, the 180 day break in service requirement under the law was suspended for retired annuitants hired to ensure adequate staffing during the state of emergency for COVID. Effective July 1st, 2021, this requirement is reinstated pursuant to section 2B of executive order N0821. As a result, Retirees cannot be employed as a retired annuitant prior to 180 days from the date of their retirement unless they have a valid exception. Um, if your agency has a retiree that plans to return to work as a retired annuitant on or after July 1st, 2021, and has not fulfilled the 180 day waiting period requirements, they will need a board approved exception to avoid violating working after retirement requirements. The exception must be approved by your agency's governing body as an action item, not on a consent calendar. For school districts, the County Office of Education is the governing body, which will need to approve the exception. Your agency must notify CalPERS directly of any individual employed pursuant to these waivers. And the notification should be emailed to CalPERS' executive order review mailbox. Uh, please note, if a retirement incentive is received by a retiree at retirement, no exceptions are available. The retiree must serve the 180 day wait period before returning to work. If your agency has a retiree that was previously approved to return to work prior to 180 days under the previous executive order N2520, has a start date prior to July 1st, 2021, and is still in the same position after July 1st, 2021, the retiree is not required to stop working and wait 180 days before returning to work. Their exception is still valid. Now I will go over the post-retirement employment requirements that remain suspended under the current executive order. These requirements are the 960 hour limit per fiscal year, 
So any hours worked by a retired annuitant to ensure adequate staffing uh, during the state of emergency will not be counted towards the 960 hour limit for a fiscal year. Please note that a retiree must have a valid exception on file under executive order N2520 for their hours to be suspended. The next requirement that remains suspended is the one-time appointment for vacant positions. Normally, retirees employed in a vacant position under government code section 21221H can only be appointed to the position once. However, this restriction remains suspended. An example would be if your agency has been unsuccessful during the recruitment process, the uh, appointed retiree can serve in that vacant position for a second appointment. Uh, and lastly, the 60-day bona fide separation in service remains suspended. And this would apply to a member that retires younger than their normal retirement age uh, based on their highest benefit formula is required to serve a 60-day bona fide separation in service. This requirement also remains suspended under the current executive order. However, the prohibition under the law on any predetermined agreement between an employer and an impending retiree who has not attained the normal retirement age continues to remain in effect consistent with the law. This requirement has not been suspended. This concludes my portion of the presentation. Um, and now I'll be passing it along to Brad Hansen. Thank you, Catalina. Excellent update. <clears throat> so how's everyone doing today? Um, judging by your silence, I'm thinking everyone's doing great. All right, so um, I'm gonna um, tag in here and talk a little bit more about this uh, COVID-19 supplemental paid sick leave. Most, if not everything that we cover today is actually in the circular letter that we sent out a few months ago, um, 2000-02321. Um, I highly recommend um, going to the CalPERS um, website and checking out that circular letter if you need to reference back to anything from today. Um, so um, here, here are some things about reporting when it comes to supplemental paid sick leave. Um, all hours of that sick leave should be reported to CalPERS. So it's basically treated exactly like sick leave is today. You know, it can't be converted for service credit at the time of retirement, but it still should be reported if people use it because it is considered comparable. So just like you would report someone else who used sick leave prior to COVID or prior to the pandemic, you would still report that as well. Those hours also count towards your membership appointment too. So it counts towards that march towards a thousand hours to make someone eligible for membership if they're not already um, deemed a member. Um, additionally, retired annuitants, now they normally write, they can't accrue sick leave. Um, but in this case, they actually can accrue this supplemental paid sick leave. And if they happen to use it, you should indeed report it to CalPERS towards their 960 hour um, that, that they're limited to as a retired annuitant. Okay, next slide, please. And then here's some hot topics that um, Kevin Lau's team's been receiving quite a bit. I think also too, some of our other teams have gotten these questions, but you know, there's been quite a few inquiries about um, reporting stipends related to COVID. And the vast majority, 99.9% .9 of them are actually not reportable to CalPERS. You know, they're all considered ad hoc payments and they don't meet the definition of comp earnable or pensionable comp, uh, which is regulation 571 for classic and 571.1. Um, you know, hazard pay is it's not really someone coming and working in hazard condition. It's more about you know, implementing um, procedures for, for avoiding hazardous um, work environments, things of that nature. Um, you know, it, it's, it's more of a implementing health and safety procedures in general, not because, oh, it's hazardous because there's, you know, there's COVID and, and whatnot. So we're going to give someone an extra stipend just because they decided to come into work or we, we allowed them to come into work. So it actually does not meet the definition. You know, and, and another thing I want to point out about that, even, even if you weren't able to come up with some type of special compensation or stipend that was reportable to CalPERS, most likely in many cases, even if it was reported, it's probably not something that's gonna be used in someone's final comp. Um, we have it in our statute that um, a special comp can't be reported solely in someone's final comp period. So let's just say for you know, the last year, you 
you somehow were able to come up with a special comp that was reportable for COVID. If it was only reported for that year and then never again, and it happened to fall in someone's final comp period, we'd ultimately end up denying it too. So it really doesn't benefit the member at, at all um, to add the special comp. Um, you know, another trend that we've seen is that um, employers are trying to convert it to an off salary schedule pay. Now, off salary schedule pay is not really related to COVID at all. It's more of like an in lieu of pay increase up to 6% for, for members um, when they don't get a pay increase. And I know that you, the schools do this quite often. It's still reportable for classic only. PEPRA, it's still not reportable. But again, you run into that same exact problem I just mentioned. If it's only reported in your final comp period, it doesn't really behoove the member to have it at all. They may have paid contributions on, on something and yeah, maybe it's posted if it's a true off salary schedule pay. But again, if it only falls in the final comp period, we're gonna end up denying it anyhow. So those members who may have been retirement age and they wanted to have additional benefit for off salary schedule pay, more than likely it won't be included because it was only reported in final comp period. You know, it can be a little bit tricky. It, it doesn't necessarily, I know that sometimes schools actually do off salary schedule pays several times throughout a member's career. In those cases, it definitely could be used. But just be careful when you do have something like OSSP to keep that part in mind that indeed it has to be reported not solely in the final comp period. And most of, of the um, inquiries we've seen have not really been qualified for off salary schedule pay. It was more of just a hidden, if you will, um, COVID stipend pay. If you have any questions on that though, and you want us to review some language or any of these potential special comp items, I highly recommend you email our MOU review mailbox. Um, I know we've mentioned it multiple times at the CEC, but this is what the email box is. It's MOU underscore review at calpers.ca.gov. Um, and um, if you send that in within a day or two, we'll get a response back to you to let you know if it's reportable or not. Okay, so if you have any questions, uh, I don't see any raised hands or anything, but go ahead and type them in the QA and I'll be sure to answer them as quickly as possible. All right, so next up is a dear friend and colleague, Jonathan Hensley, and he's gonna talk about AB 1309. Jonathan, take it away. Thank you, Brad. Um, I'm Jonathan Hensley. In case any of you don't know, I'm from the Financial Reporting and Accounting Services Division. I'm the Assistant Division Chief over Pension and Health Accounting. So most of your bills come from my area. Um, next slide, please. So today we're going to review what is Assembly Bill 1309. Um, towards the end, in case if any of you saw that there were some bills created on August 2nd, I'm going to address that. Um, I think you'll have a favorable response with what I'm going to tell you. Um, so what is Assembly Bill 1309? It was effective January 1st of 2018. Um, it amended Government Code 21220 of the Public Employees account, Accounting Law. Um, it authorized the board to assess a fee if employers failed to enroll and report payroll for a retired annuitant. The fees began to assess um, on July 1 of 18. And the main goal of this is to ensure that we have accurate reporting and that we can track the hours. Next slide, please. So why? Retired annuity and late fees are assessed solely for the purpose of maintaining an accurate administrative record in MyCalPERS. Employers will incur these fees as a result of a late enrollment and or late or missing payroll reporting. The assessed fees cannot be passed along from the employer to the employees. Next slide, please. So, the responsibility of the employer based on AB 1309 is enrollment. Employers must enroll a retired annuitant employed in any capacity without reinstatement within 30 days of their hire date. Otherwise, a fee of $200 will be assessed per month until that retired annuitant is enrolled in MyCalPERS. The payroll reporting. Employers must report and post payroll for a retired annuitant employed in any capacity without reinstatement within 30 days following the last day of the earned period. Otherwise, a $200 fee will be assessed per month until the payroll is posted in MyCalPERS. And yes, that is every month that they're not enrolled, a fee can and will be assessed. Next slide, please. So we do have ways that if there's extraordinary events, 
for employers to get waivers. Um, right now, I wanna talk about what happened on August 2nd. On August 2nd, we um, ran our billing process and it didn't run as we expected. Um, and those fees right now are in the process of being reversed. But future fees, if you get a fee, an employer can request a waiver for a late fee for late fees assessed. CalPERS and my team will grant each employer a one and only fee waiver um, with the understanding they will be able to maintain compliance in the future. After that's granted, future waiver requests will not be accepted unless of extraordinary events, such as our system doesn't bill accurately um, or other possible natural disasters that we know happen in uh, the state of California. Next slide, please. So our response to the pandemic and the stay at home orders, um, CalPERS took the initiative that we waive the fees during the shutdown orders. The fees assessed from March of 2020 to June of 21 were automatically waived. The billing that happened in August unfortunately picked up some of those periods. And since we were automatically waiving the fees at that time, that is why we are reversing the bills that were sent on August 1st automatically. You don't need to contact us to get it reversed. It's happening. It should be done by 2 p.m. today. Um, if you see something or don't, please contact. Um, the contact information I will give you um, in just another slide. Next slide, please. So to request a fee waiver for, for any of you is through the MyCalPERS application. And what you need to do is log in, go to the reporting tab and payroll schedules, and then there's a late fee list. Select the fee hyperlink and enter the reason for the appeal, and then hit submit. The status of the appeal can be tracked and viewed in the appeal status column. Um, I would say on average, it takes us about three days to get through um, appeals depending on the volume. Um, we try to do things within a day, um, but we know as we launch these back out there, there's gonna be quite a bit of questions and answer that we can help with. Um, next, next slide, please. Um, so far, I don't see any questions or hands up. I'm going uh, to- We have a question from Bina. Yes. One second. Dina, go ahead and unmute your mic and ask a question. I wanted to request, we have a waiver one, you give us one waiver per county office. Is it possible to have the waiver per district? Because when you have 50 entities and you only give one waiver, it doesn't really work for us. Uh, what I would suggest, and we'll review this on a case-by-case -case basis, is um, if you have something that each district is getting something, I believe we look at it as separate. I can get back to you on a case-by-case -case basis, but put the waiver in, we'll review, review it, and we will give you what our determination is. Um, to blanketly say that, I can't at this time, but we will review each waiver um, request individually and the merits of the waiver. Um, we try to be very fair and um, consistent in what we do. Okay, that's it, Jonathan. Okay. Well, I would like to welcome Brad Hansen back and thank you all very much. Well, so that was a nice little breather so I can get on to this next presentation, which is actually um, a really cool thing that we've done, I believe. And I think it will be really helpful for all employers, including schools going forward. Um, so um, we got to thinking and, um, you know, we send out tons of circular letters um, throughout the years about different compensation items. You know, what's reportable, what's, what's not reportable. Um, do you have any sample language? Do you have any you know, commonly asked questions? Which you know, we're always glad to help and, and we're always glad to answer those questions too. And you can still hit us up whenever you want. But 
what we decided to do was create a web page on the CalPERS online website, you know, www.calpers.ca.gov, that, so, that solely deals with compensation reporting questions and answers in sample language. If you would, please, next slide. So um, we sent out a circular letter, and forgive me, I don't remember the exact date. I want to say it was middle of June this year. Um, just to basically give everybody a heads up that, hey, this new web page is out there and it's for your use and you can go out there and find any type of information you need on compensation. I do want to say it is a work in progress. Um, you know, it doesn't have everything that we want in there yet, but it's, it's up and standing and it, it's got a lot of good info out there. Um, like I already kind of mentioned, you know, we, we added some common reporting scenarios out there. Um, that you know, many of you guys have encountered. In fact, some of the scenarios that we came up with were come, we came from some of our school employers. Um, common labor policy and agreement issues. You know, so that's been a real hot topic. You know, with that Senate Bill 278 out there looming, um, audit findings, um, employer review findings that many of the schools and other employers have had. Right, we we get flooded with tons of inquiries about their. Um, about employers' labor agreements and, and MOU. So we kind of put some sample language out there. Now that's the piece that's kind of a work in progress. We only got a few things out there now, but Kevin and I are fast at work, you know, trying to work with our public affairs team to get more and more samples out there. So, you know, make sure to keep posted on the website and, and there will be more out there for you. Um, also too, one of the coolest parts is we created this really neat table. Um, it's called the Special Compensation Reportability Table. And if you would go to the next slide, and there's a screenshot of what it looks like. So it's really cool. It's kind of an interactive um, chart, if you will. You can see at the top, there's different tabs, um, you know, incentive pay, educational, premium, special assignment, statutory. So you click that tab, and then you can actually search for the type of special comp you're looking for or you just can sort using that screen there. So like for instance here at the very top, you know, we have the incentive pays up and it says bonus is reportable for miscellaneous, safety, safety police, and it's for classic members. But as you see with PEPRA, it's blank. So that means it's not reportable. So if you ever have a question as if something is reportable or not for classic or PEPRA, it should be on this um, particular screen here. And you see there's little notes on there that kind of give you a, a quick idea of why it, it is reportable or not reportable or little specific things in there that you need to keep in mind. Um, so, you know, if you haven't yet, please go out there and play around with it. If you have any ideas for new things that you want added to this page, please email me and I'd be more than happy to um, entertain those ideas and perhaps get them on the website. I want to make this really efficient and easy to use. Um, so that way that if you ever have a, on a whim, have a question about compensation, you could go to this website and perhaps find the answer you're looking for. We also have a portal to that MLU review um, website, uh, or excuse me, MLU review um, email box that I mentioned earlier. So if you want to send your questions in, you can also do it through this web page. And one of the things that I really want to do, and I've been working with our division um, of CEOD um, on, um, on this idea, it probably won't come for a year or so, but we want to start introducing some like training classes as well on here. Maybe some quick videos that show you um, some of the different types of presentations that we do throughout the year, like things that we do at the Ed Forum, things that we do at the SEAC, just a quick little video that kind of talks to you about special comp items, MOUs, labor agreements, you name it. So it's a work in progress, but please go out there, play around with it, have fun with it. Um, and if you have any ideas, just go ahead and send me an email, or you could even send an email to the MOU review mailbox, and um, we'll, we'll work to make this a tool that everybody can enjoy using and get the answers that they're looking for. Okay, so that's really all I had to say on that. I know that was kind of short and sweet. But I'm actually going to pass it over to, I have to look at my notes here. I can't remember who the next person is. I'm going to pass it over to Veronica Silva Gill from EAMD to talk about Social Security Administrator updates. Veronica, take it away. Thank you, Brad. Uh, good morning. Um, hello, my name is Veronica Silva Gill. I'm the leader of the state Social Security Administrator team. And today I would like to provide you some updates from our team. Um, first, I want to review the annual information requests that occur per last uh, fiscal year. And then next, I wanna to talk to you about the, um, the state social security administrator program funding fees and tell you um, 
also about our, um, uh, one of the projects that our unit is tackling this year, which is cleaning up some of the data in my CalPERS. Next slide, please. So for the fiscal year 2020, 2021 was the first year that we sent out an annual information request to all the school districts. Um, this questionnaire helped our team to determine if the districts um, Social Security and Medicare tax withholding practices we thought you know, were um, compliant. In some instances, we reached out to the school districts to get clarification. And if we saw something that perhaps was out of compliance, you know, based on uh, the understanding of the law, we reached out to the district and explained, you know, the, um, the potential issues that we found. Um, so we're happy to say that our team uh, issued 1,522 annual information requests or AIRs, we call them AIRs for short. Um, and we received an overwhelming response of 1136, which is 75% response rate. Um, you know, uh, please, you know, a round of applause. I am very happy. Uh, I want to thank you for, um, for your time and collaboration. I know that this was a little bit hard for the school districts because some of the people that would be responsible to provide this information um, did not have access to my CalPER. So I know that took some time and, um, you know, in training. And we, um, we really appreciate it. And I want to tell you that we appreciate your efforts. Uh, now, for the, for the next fiscal year and, you know, and on, we will continue to provide the, um, the annual information request. Um, if you or your team has any suggestions on, you know, on changing uh, some of the language of the questions, you know, we are welcome for suggestions. You know, this was our first year with this particular questionnaire. So if you think that we can improve it, you know, we're always, um, you know, willing to help and, you know, we can work with implementing as many ideas as we um, possibly can. Uh, next slide, please. So now for uh, what is changing for this fiscal year for 2021 is that our team will continue to issue the, uh, the air, but we will not be issuing the, um, the invoices this year. Um, we're taking a holiday um, and our team issued a circular letter um, a couple months ago, I believe. Um, so if you have any questions, you know, the information is contained there. Uh, next slide, please. So now our team is tackling, uh, cleaning up uh, some of the data that we found in my CalPERS. So our project for this fiscal year, hopefully we'll be done this fiscal year, is to clean up some of the school district's uh, profiles. So um, earlier this year, when we reached out to the County Offices of Education to verify the employee count for each school district, um, our team found that some of the school district names um, have changed or some school districts, you know, were uh, no longer around. So, you know, that although we've been reaching out every year to the County Office of Education for that information, it seems that we still have, you know, some missing um, information. And so we, you know, we'd like to clean it up this year, especially because we're not issuing um, invoices. So I think that's a good, this is a good year for us to, um, to tackle this project. So based on the information that we received from the county offices of education earlier this year, we're going to start, you know, with that list and then uh, move on, um, you know, to clean up the uh, information. So um, we may reach out to the county offices of education or to the school district if we're not able to locate the, the solution documents or the name change documents. Um, you know, once we obtain all the information, we'll update my CalPERS. And then we'll also work with the Social Security Administration so that they can update their records as well. Um, so I want to thank you in advance for your cooperation. I know we might be bugging you a lot for this. Uh, hopefully not too much, but um, you know that's that's something that is coming up. Next slide. So now you know, or the you know the main idea of this cleanup practice is also that we upload all of the modifications that are associated with each of the school districts. Um, you know, some of the school districts have entered into separate uh, modifications to provide either Medicare or coverage for the retirement system ineligibles, either of CalPERS or CalSTRS. So, you know, we want to locate that and make it easy for your school districts to have that information at their fingertips in my CalPERS. So, um, you know, as part of that cleanup project, we're also going to be um, adding and um, modifying the documents that are associated with each of the modifications for the school districts. 
And then at the end of all that, we will send to each of the county offices of education a letter that will list out all of the modifications that are associated with the school districts you know, under each of the county offices of education. And then um, also that, uh, that letter will also explain the coverage of that modification. So if it's a uh, Medicare modification, we will we'll tell you that. And if it's a, um, a modification that provides additional coverage for um, retirement system ineligibles, then uh, we'll explain that as well. Here's some contact information in case you have any questions. And um, I know that's uh, it's a very short presentation, but um, next slide, please. I'll, I'll take your questions now. Okay, uh, Vina, do you have a question? Okay, do we have a, uh, you have a question? Uh, no, I'm sorry, I don't have it. Okay, thanks. All right, if we don't have any questions, I'll go ahead and uh, give it back to you, Susan. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Um, this is a good time to go ahead and take a short 10 minute break. Um, during the break, please enjoy this really wonderful video featuring May Lee, who has served California for over 77 years. Um, then we'll have some nice music to listen to after the video, but let's get back here at 1025. All right, see you then. This is a full three months of food without needing any refrigeration. We didn't have computers, we didn't have cellular phones, calculators. In the old days, we had the contometer, which you manually have to push the dial. We didn't have air conditioning, we didn't have uh, uh, nice lighting. Now you just press the button electronically, it transfer from here to there. My name is May Lee. I work for Department of General Services. 
in the facility management division. I've been working for the state since 1945, which makes it 70, 70 years. I started public service way, way back when I was in high school. When I was a senior in high school, I worked in the principal's office. And I kept their ADA, which is the average attendant record for them. I was uh, raised and we went to the Alton or in a segregated school. My father had about seven ranches. So he taught me how to keep records of all the different ranches. I learned to run the backers and uh, add expense and keep track of the income. September 26, 1963, they called me up and said, your new department is called General Services. There was no accounting system set up. Through the year, I did all the accounting system for general service. One of the things I'm proud of is I'm able to figure out how to get out of the red into the black on the funding, such as the Architecture Revolving Fund was $27 million a whole. Even the order gave up. So I decided to take a shot at it, and I figured out what's wrong. In five and a half years, we pulled it out. We were in a, in a black now. There's an article 19 in the Constitution that said there was no Chinese to be hired in public uh, work. And I wrote to the uh, Senate and explain that that's in violation of the U.S. Constitution. So I uh, submitted and they asked me to visit the Senate with a special pass on May 12, 1945. In 1955, they repealed that section of the state constitution. You don't have to do crossword puzzles just to keep your brain. Volunteer, do something, be active, and uh, keep moving around. <laughs> June 23rd, I'll be 100 years old, and I will have 77 years of state service as of June 7th, so that's a long span of time. <laughs> <laughs>
All right. Welcome back, everyone. We're going to get started again right now. And um, Ryan and Megan are up. Go ahead, Ryan and Megan. All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ryan Beaker, and I'm a research data analyst with the MyCalper System Support Team. Uh, next slide, please. So this is our agenda for today. Our presentation will cover recent enhancements and some upcoming system enhancements. We'll also discuss how to use employer reports, also known as Cognos reports, and some helpful reports we think you should run on a regular basis. I will also touch on the retirement appointment maintenance and include a friendly reminder about that at the end of this presentation. Next slide, please. All right, so the recent enhancements. Um, starting at the first one there, <clears throat> we updated the retirement enrollment screen. So the first two I'm gonna go over are both optional, but we highly encourage you to use these extra fields that we included in that. Because at the end of the day, the most information that we have to make a determination, the faster it's gonna be on the back end to help with things like retired annuitants and membership issues. So first off, we've included the enrollment reason. We recently added some PERS language directly into the enrollment screen, so you don't have to flip back and forth from our public agency and schools reference guide. Now everything is built into our system. Enrollment reasons include already a member, full time for six months or more, at least half time for one year or more, completed 1,000 hours in a fiscal year, elected PERS membership or other. If other is selected, this populates a text box that you could type into. Next, we have the retired annuitant type, uh, which includes extra help, earnings limit, vacant position, FERP. We also included a 180 day exception indicator with a yes, no option. If yes is selected, please also select the appointed by governing body and when doing so, a hyperlink to upload the resolution that was approved, uh, approved by our governing body will show on the screen. Again, those are optional fields. Next, I'm gonna hit on that mandatory requirement. The mandatory requirement that we included into that retirement enrollment screen is the certificated employee per government code 20636.1. This is a yes, no indicator. Um, we've also included this on our XML uh, files and the schemas. So you have any issues with formatting your XML files, you could email our employer underscore technical underscore support at calpers.ca.gov. Lastly, on our public website, we've recently added the electronic gateway payment. So like I mentioned, this is on our public website. And this allows members and employers with an invoice number um, to make one-time non-reoccurring payments without having to log into MyCalPERS. You can use a debit card, credit card, or bank account to submit payments instead of mailing a check. Uh, things like replacement benefit contributions or social security fees for uh, employers, that's what we would use here. And there's a picture of it on this screen. Next slide, please. So these are our upcoming system enhancements. We have a certificated members Cognos report. Uh, this is a brand new Cognos report uh, that will help identify its certificated members. The report will include the member's name, member's CalPERS ID, appointment ID, appointment effective date, appointment end date, appointment status, date appointment marked certificated, date appointment ended as certificated. Next, we have some FAQs uh, that were created by PERS business areas to help improve the member's experience, experience through the payment process. This will help reduce some questions member may have regarding the new payment process through the electronic gateway payment. Next, demographic changes. Confirmation letters will be generated when internal users update personal demographic information. Letters will be mailed to the new and old address. Uh, if multiple updates are made within the same day, the system will only generate one notification. 
Uh, this is a pretty exciting one. We have a non-contributory appointment notification. So we will send a contributory notification letter to employers and members when a member has one active non-contributory appointment and a contributory appointment, and then separates from that contributory appointment. The letter will be generated to the lowest level, level division and a courtesy copy will be sent to the County Office of Education. So that's really important, something that used to come up all the time. Um, if you have a member that has one appointment uh, at one school district and maybe a part-time at the other, let's say that person ends that full-time contributory appointment. Well, how does the other school district know when that happens? Now that notification letter is gonna get sent out automatically when situations like that arise. So that, that's pretty cool. Lastly, uh, we've updated some language uh, surrounding publications and welcome letters. So really what we did here is replace and consolidate existing uh, with new publications. So we've really just added some text um, specifically to publication three, which is Welcome to CalPERS, a benefits guide for school members. And then we also did that with publication five, uh, which is also Welcome to CalPERS, a benefit guides for public agency and members, but that one's geared toward your safety members that you might have working at the school districts. Next slide, please. Lastly, we just wanted to showcase our system enhancements page on our public website. So if you go to our public website and click on the employers tab, under the Mike Cowper's technical requirements, you'll see we have a system enhancements page listed there. So be, for, be sure to check that out. Uh, if you know there's a new release coming out, um, you could always click on that link there to see what we recently updated um, to the Mike Cowper system. Next slide, please. All right, so now we're gonna get into our Cognos report section. For those of you who do not know what a Cognos report is, a Cognos report uses your agency's data in MyCalPERS and generates predefined reports. Cognos reports can be generated in various formats such as PDF, CSV, HTML, or Excel, and can be saved in the Cognos application or on your hard drive. Uh, we recently published a circular letter. So if you want to reference this material later, reference circular letter 200-050-21. So the first one there, you'll see a CalPERS ID and appointment ID. This will reconcile retirement appointments for members uh, with multiple appointments. The report displays the participant's partial social security number and related CalPERS ID, appointment ID, and effective date for the business partner. Sorry, it looks like I skipped one there. The very first one is the business partner, my CalPERS user access. I'm gonna go back to that one. So a system access administrator can view who has the correct assigned role to run a specific report. This report displays the MyCalPERS user and their assigned access role, including the access start and end dates. Next, we have a benefit recipient by employer report. That simply just lists uh, anyone who may be retired within your agency who may be receiving a benefit. Next, we have a missing participant uh, payroll record. And that one's just showing who will have missing payroll. Um, Specifically, this report will display participants with missing payroll records for payroll, service credit purchases, supplemental income plan, and overpayment deductions in the regular earned period report. Next, we have the retirement appointment reconciliation, uh, everyone's favorite report. That will show you any active appointment who has unposted pay affiliated to it. Next slide, please. Next, we have the posted contribution detail report. Uh, this will view a participant's reported contributions for a defined period. This report displays details of earnings and compensation, special compensation, 1959 survivor contributions reported for a participant within a selected date range. Next, we have the payroll report summary. View a receipt, uh, receipt of your posted payroll. This report displays payroll uh, statistics and financial information for a specific regular earned period or adjustment report. Next, we have the retired annuitant late fee status. 
This receives, uh, this report displays details on retarded noted late fees, fee type, amount, earn period, dates, due date, and status of appeals. And then we have the retired annuity and hours worked report. And this report displays the hours retired annuitants work for all employers within selected date parameters, broken down by division. Um, that's generally a good report to run, just to double check. Are we getting close to that 960 hours? You could always run that report uh, to see where your retired annuitants are so you don't run the risk of going over that 960 hour limit. Next slide, please. Lastly, we have some additional resources listed there. So I know I kind of sped through some of those most important reports you should be running on a regular basis. If you want to reference that material later, uh, please reference that circular letter 200-050-21. So we do have all the Cognos reports listed on our public website. Um, what's really nice about that feature is that it lists every single report that we have along with the actual user role that you need to access that report. So you go to our public website and you wanna run that retired annuitant late fee report. You go back into that Cognos window and you try to open it up and you have some error message there. That's because you don't have the correct assigned role. So that's where you would typically go to your system access administrator say, hey, you know, we really need to run this report. It's getting close to the end of the fiscal year. And we really need to make sure those retired annuitants don't run over that 960 hour limit. So um, every report we have will be listed there. And there's a little sample. All the CalPERS IDs are fake. All the uh, business partners are fake. I think it says ABC company. So reference that to see what we have available uh, just to browse our options. So when you actually get in the MyCalPERS system, you know what you can run. Lastly, we have several student guides that are available to you as a resource that give very detailed step-by-step -step instructions on how to run those report. Um, so we do have a browser requirement student guide. So again, if you, if you know you have the actual user role and you're still having issues running that Cognos report, it could be some browser requirement issue that you may have. Uh, most likely a pop-up blocker is enabling you to do that. So we do have that browser requirement student guide as well as the actual employer report student guide listed as well. Again, I highly recommend checking out that student guide. It shows step-by-step -step options, how to do everything there, and it also shows screens, screenshots there as well. Lastly, we have uh, some online classes for those employer reports. So if you're interested in checking that out, we do have classes. Um, whether you wanna watch it at your own pace and do computer-based training, or if you actually want to go to a webinar class with the live instructor, you also have the option to do that. Next slide, please. All right, again, everybody's favorite topic, the retirement employment reconciliation. Um, this is just a friendly reminder to complete those monthly reconciliation processes. So a lot of those fees were turned off. Um, as Jonathan mentioned, they are turning back on. So as such, uh, we just want to encourage you to complete those reconciliation processes. That means keeping up on those retirement appointments, separating those members who no longer work for you, and make sure you stay on top of your unposted payroll. Um, just to let you know, the automated permanent separation process is still happening. So with that, confirming unposted payroll will not stop this from happening. So you can um, report either zero payroll instead, or go ahead and report a leave of absence um, for that period that's coming in question. So again, simply confirming unposted payroll will not stop the automated process from happening. You need to either report a zero payroll period, or you need to account for a leave of absence or a separation. And lastly, just a friendly reminder to report a leave of absence when those happens. Um, because if you do not report a leave of absence, let's say someone's out on maternity, something like that, and you might know they're on a leave of absence, here at CalPERS, we have a really hard time finding out who's on a leave of absence. Again, if there's a situation where we have unposted pay, 
you know, for six months, that person may be caught up in that automated separation. So just make sure you're reporting those leave of absence in a normally timely fashion. Next slide, please. All right, and here is the question section, which Megan will take over for me. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. I don't see any raised hands. We had a couple that came through. Raised hands. We have some questions. Okay. Okay, so the first question is from Nia. Go ahead, Nia, ask your question. Okay, I will reset that. Okay, let's try uh, Ramona. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, Ramona. Awesome. One of the enhancements was where you can um, put the enrollment reason at the time that the appointment is created. Are you going to have that available when we look at the appointment, um, say that it was already created, and then we inspect that appointment at a later time? That's not viewable currently. Is that going to be viewable? It, it will be viewable if you provide a reason. If you don't provide a reason, it will be blank. I didn't even see where it was. Because um, when I went and looked at someone that one of my districts had appointed, it didn't even have a field where it would show blank or anything. Let me, one second. Because I was trying to figure out why they appointed somebody. What, was it, this was in the past though, correct? Um, it was, I want to say a month or two ago. So it was after that feature has been enabled. Okay. Would you mind emailing me that person or sure. that helper's ID? Um, and you can use the employer technical support box. You can also use the SEAC mailbox. Um, and we'll take a look. It okay. should have displayed if, um, if it was there. And it should be on the appointment details and events page. And that's where I went to the appointment. It, and then okay. I wanted to inspect that the detail of that. Where they okay. spend the appointment. Yeah, yeah, go ahead and send that to me. Um, to, so I can take a look and maybe see if something on our end is not working okay. the way we think it is. I will do that, Megan, thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay, we have Lucinda. Hi. <clears throat> um, I have a question related to the automatic um, um, posting um, you know, the permanent separations, um, especially this time, you know, due to COVID, a lot of people didn't work for, you know, 9, 10, 12 months. And we have issues where we did not actually terminate the employee. The employee was still employed. They just weren't working. Um, and we also have seasonal programs that only work about six months out of the year that um, they were automatically being separated, but yet they were still an employee. Um, I have heard different things from CalPERS. What is the best way to handle that situation when um, CalPERS is automatically terming um, and putting end dates um, after six months for employees, but they're still an employee? I've heard that we just take the end date off. I've also heard that we have to create another appointment, which is a lot of extra work for us. Um, so I'm just wondering what is the best way to handle that when they should not have been terminated? So and if you go ahead. Or zero payment, but our system um, doesn't have that capability. Right. Um, so we understand that that's difficulty and that not everybody can report zero payroll. So 
our best recommendation, if they're not working, is to put them on a leave of absence because if they're on a leave of absence, they won't be included in this process. Um, if that's also not an option, um, then unfortunately, the only thing is to have them appear in that process and then get the list from us. Um, and then you would just remove that separation, but you would have to do that every month. Um, those are really the two things. I, As far as the membership rules about creating a new appointment or leaving them on, I would need to defer to the membership team to give you the best advice um, as far as being a member goes. Um, but as far as the, the actual system and the processing, both the leaves of absences and the um, zero payroll are the only thing that will remove them from being included in the permanent separations. Okay, and you know we have hundreds of people, <laughs> and so it's not feasible for you know us to go in and put them on leave either. Um, and so just removing the end date um, is sufficient. Um, and does that cause no. any issues? So if you were the, you mean the permanent separation date? Yes. Yeah. So if you remove the permanent separation date and then no payroll is reported of any kind, um, they can appear on the next month's permanent separation list. Um, so we would only be removing them if they had payroll to post that month. And so oh. if they had payroll to post, um, you know, we look at it and the, this person never left. It's just a sub who hasn't worked or it's due to COVID, they haven't worked. Or it's our migrant program because we have a, a, a large district that has a migrant program and they only work six months out of the year. So at the beginning, um, and it was April and May, beginning, it's like they were all coming up with end dates, but yet they're still employed. Um, and so I was just taking off end dates and I just wanted to make sure that that was um, the right process. Um, the, yes and no. The, if they are employed with you and you remove the permanent separation date because they are still actively employed with you, then that is the correct process. But if you don't have payroll or zero payroll reported or they're not on leave, then they will still appear on that list. Okay. Hi, um, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, Michelle. Good. Hi, Megan, yeah. thank you. Hi. Is, um, Michelle, hi, I'll go ahead and turn my video on. Um, I just wanna chime in from a membership perspective. That is correct, Megan. Um, they would need to report zero payroll. Um, so something is in there to prevent that perm sap. <clears throat> so I just wanted to make sure that that was clear if you had done that, but you, you can't just report nothing uh, for six months plus because then you'll be appear on that report and then be separated by CalPERS because from our perspective, um, there's, there's no payroll coming in. So that person is no longer employed somewhere. Um, hopefully that makes sense from a main, but from a membership perspective, please make sure that you report that zero payroll. Okay, thank you. I'll work with our system to see if there's a way to do that. Okay, thank you. And I, I've heard that from a, a few people. So we're going to have our own internal discussions as well and see if we can come up with um, maybe a, an alternative solution for everybody as well. Okay, we have a question from Lucinda. Go ahead, Lucinda. Unmute the microphone. I just, it was just Lucinda talking. So I'm done with my question. Thank you. All right, thank you. And we have Monica. Go ahead, Monica. All right, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, on slide 43 about the automated permanent separations, um, I, when I read this, I think I misread it. So I just wanted to make sure that I understand it. The part that says confirm unposted payroll will not stop this. So by this, you mean that even though we're confirming the unposted payroll every month, you guys will still permanently separate them after the six months. So right. is that what that refers to? Yes, that is okay. correct. Thank you. I, I totally misread it the first time I went through it. So I just wanted to make sure that's what it was. Okay. So thank you. That's all I needed. <laughs> of course. 
us. Okay, and we're gonna try um, Mia one more time. Mia, are you there? Mia? Okay, uh, let's go with Vina. Vina? Okay, my first question is about the, I have two questions. One is about the electronic gateway payment. I wanted to make sure I'm clear. Um, is it only one time payment or every month a district can make a health payment, for example? Because right now the county office is making the health payments for the districts because they don't have a EFT set up. So I wanted to see, can a district make the health invoices with this new process on their own every month? So um, I need to defer that to the financial office since they do own this process. And I don't know if Jonathan, you are able to answer that question now. If not, we can do it on after the meeting. Okay, and I have one other question. Go ahead, Dina. Oh, okay. Um, well, I think Jonathan was gonna be able to answer the question or at least speak to the first question. Okay. Yeah. Can, can I make sure that I heard the question correctly? Yes. Um, the health invoices, are we talking about being paid on the payment portal? Yes. Yeah, and I don't, we don't have that um, ability yet. We've opened it up to for the social security and for the RBF invoices. Yeah. Um, but I can take that back as a future um, payment item. Okay, but those are done every month. The health invoices, yes. Yes. Okay, I just wanted to make sure like annual invoices and uh, replacement benefit are not paid every month, but health invoices are. And we would like to see that. Okay, I'll take that back. Okay, thank you. And I have one other question about the Cognos report. Go ahead. Okay, because sometimes I don't know if I you can hear me or you already turned my... Oh, you're good. <laughs> okay. Um, the Cognos reports. Um, can our districts have access to those Cognos reports as well? Um, what was the name of it one more time? My name? No, no, no. The name uh, of the Cognos report. Oh, I, I just mean in general, for example, retirement reconciliation or benefits? They have, so it's based on their permission sets and online on the CalPERS online website, you can either search by Cognos or you can go into the technical resources. Um, we have an entire list of all of the Cognos reports and then the permission sets needed to access those reports. So depending on what permission sets your districts have, which is oftentimes a read-only role, um, we will open up reports for that read-only role. Um, I know the retirement appointment reconciliation is one, um, and I believe the certificated one is one as well, just off the top of my head. So it's done by, um, it's done by the name of the report, and then you can also search if you know the name of the permission set to see what is available for that too. Okay, got it. Thank you. First, does that answer your question? Yes, okay. I have to just check it out now on my own. Thank you, Megan. All right, thank you. That's all the questions we have right now. Okay, I have a few more in Q&A. I will answer. Um, by typing, um, but I'm going to pass this along to Jennifer Rains and Jennifer Helfen Gomez. Thank you, Megan. Hi, I am Jennifer and I am with the CalPERS um, Education and Outreach Division. 
And um, I am here today with Jennifer from Calsters and Gary with Edjoin. And we're gonna talk a little bit about a new exciting partnership we have. Um, CalPERS is kind of new to the partnership. So initially I'm gonna send it right over to Jennifer and she's gonna talk a little bit about the background of the partnership. Next slide, please. Thank you, Jennifer. So I believe most of you, if not all know um, who EdJoin is, but if you don't, um, they are the ones that uh, have most, if not all, uh, job postings for public education in California. Um, they are able to post those for both classified and certificated positions. And it's operated out of the San Joaquin County Office of Education. And um, in 2019, when Tony Thurman became the state superintendent of instruction, he had mentioned um, a concern throughout the state that there were specific pockets of districts that were having problems retaining educators. They were leaving the the um, education profession earlier than expected. And so that was something that was um, high on his agenda to uh, look at. And so he commissioned his staff, Calsters and EdJoin, um, most specifically with the goal to contact our members or prospective members as soon as possible. And so what that led to is um, some work that we've been doing over the last couple of years and planning to um, have information posted on EdJoin in all of the, the job postings. And so um, also what we had heard, Gary was having some meetings with school employers and they had also mentioned a desire to have um, the classified positions that were covered under CalPERS also join in in this partnership. So in early 2021, we invited CalPERS to join us and they were happy to do so. And so we're continuing this partnership to this day. Um, I'm gonna turn the time over to Gary quickly to talk about EdJoin and what's going on recently um, with the site. So Gary, are you online? Yes, I am. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, so we've actually been experiencing a huge uptake in the volume of users to our EdJoin site. First of all, we are so excited to partner with Calsters and CalPERS. Um, and not just us, I think a lot of our districts are. Actually, I know all of our districts and county offices are. Um, just over the last six months, the traffic has increased on EdJoin and we're getting 107, we, we, over the last six months, we just recently pulled our report. We've had 117 million page views. So that, what a page view is, is that means someone is coming to our sites and our site and continually going through and clicking on our different, different pages within EdJoin, which for us is, a, is, is doubled our, our, our traffic. Um, we've got over 4.5 new, uh, 4.5 million new users to EdJoin. So um, just to give you an idea, Covered California's database is not even anywhere near um, what our database is when it comes to the amount of uh, traffic that we are generating on the sites. So um, I'll turn it back over to, to, to Jennifer's. And, and, <laughs> Thank uh, you, Gary. <laughs> next, next slide, please. So the feeling is mutual, Gary. I was so excited to hear that um, about this and joint partnership. Um, and it, I think it's super important for CalPERS and why um, here is a little snippet from our website um, from a couple of years ago. At that point, we had approximately 2 million members. And if you look at that top percentage, 38%, almost around 760,000 members are our school members. So being able to partner with EdJoin offered a unique opportunity for us to be able to reach out to them. Now, I mentioned I work in the CEOD, Customer Education and Outreach Division. I actually work in one of the regional offices in Fresno, and I've worked here for 13 years. And um, I see a very typical scenario with, with our membership, um, with our school members in, in particular. Um, their very first introduction to CalPERS is when they're getting ready to retire. They come in and say, okay, I'm ready to retire and I've worked for you guys for about 20 years. Can you just give me it all in a nutshell right now? And of course, we want people to be aware of their relationship with CalPERS and their ability to, um, to actually control the amount of money that they'll be getting in retirement through different methods of working longer and whatnot, maybe a service credit purchase. So this offered us a very unique opportunity to be able to uh, um, reach members at the very onset of their careers. Um, 
Jennifer, why is the uh, partnership important to CalSTRS? Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, very similar situation here in our CalSTRS offices. We get members that come in and say, okay, I, what do I do? Can you tell me what to do? I'm so overwhelmed. And so what we want to do is look at our membership as um, a life cycle. And as soon as we can reach them, which hopefully is when they're looking for a job or shortly thereafter, we want to have that first initial uh, uh, touch base with them so that we can provide them what they need um, at the beginning of their career, throughout their career, and you know, if they have life changes such as getting married, having children, getting sick and going on a leave, so that they can really take advantage of um, making decisions and choices along the way so that when they move into retirement, it is a smooth transition and not something that is really stressful. And so it's important because, as you see in this slide, 54% of those um, studied or uh, polled said that financial or money matters is the biggest stress for them. Um, you can see the other things listed there. Next slide, please. Additionally, this is quite shocking, but the median retirement account balance for individuals under 65 in the US is zero. So with a defined benefit, as we know, that's gonna um, supply a good cushion for our members. They also need to save more outside of our systems, but um, having the, the fringe benefit of a defined benefit is great to have. Next slide, please. And finally, this is really neat to see. Um, millennials, who are the largest group working today, 84% that are in government or state uh, jobs say that they're staying in the profession because of their pension. And 71% would leave their job or the profession if their benefits were cut or eliminated. So again, that push for that DB early on, um, we hope will retain educators and our school employees long-term so that they have a very a robust pension um, for the rest of their lives. Next slide, please. So again, what we're doing is partnering with EdJoin and you will see in a couple of slides that in each job posting, there is information or a link to either the CalPERS or CalSTRS websites and, and additional information. Um, what this is right here is just um, a, a sample of on our .com, we have career pages and it's broken down into career stages, early, mid, near retirement, part-time educators and those that are already retired and there's specific information catered to that group. So our members, as they look at that job posting on EdJoin can go ahead and click that um, link and then go to our website and learn more. Um, next slide, please. And in addition to that, um, some of your districts may use EdJoin's platform for your onboarding. So you may push out um, maybe the HR paperwork that they need to sign. Um, and you can also have um, our onboarding and retention toolkit linked um, through the onboarding platform through EdJoin. Also, if you don't use EdJoin for your onboarding, if you do it yourself, this is also available on our.com that you can access anytime. And these are um, six small lesson plans. So we don't want you to we don't want you to do the teaching, but we want to provide you resources. So if you have a member, whether they're brand new or if they've been in your district for 20 years and they have a question about purchasing service credit, we have a teaching module there where you can go ahead and look at it, provide some of the links or the form, and then say, hey, go ahead and watch the video on .com at calsters.com. If you have further questions, contact Calsters for a deeper dive. So again, not only are we just having the career educator pages, but we're also having small lesson plans that hopefully you can then um, give out to your membership as a resource for them. Next slide. So thank you, Jen. So this is um, a sample of a classified um, position job posting on the EdJoin website. And you can see that the CalPERS link is right there um, to get people to click on it to learn about their CalPERS retirement benefits that may be available with that um, job posting. Um, next slide, please. So when they click on this, it'll take them directly to this uh, web page, this orphan web page that we created specifically for our school members um, who are looking for classified um, positions. And it talks about um, what a, what a, who a CalPERS school member is, what the benefits of having that defined benefit plan are. Um, as Jen mentioned earlier, there's a lot of financial insecurity um, in, our, in, our, um, in our world right now. So this talks about the benefits of having a, benef a defined benefit plan for um, their retirement. 
um, among other things. It gives a basic overview about um, their retirement benefits as well. And once they're in this special page, they can click on it into our.com. Next, um, next slide, please. Um, where we have a lot of information available um, for our members um, and also available to you to help onboard your new members. We do have a special web page specifically for brand new members in our life events section. And it talks about everything somebody coming on brand new to CalPERS needs to know. Um, so we think that having this information available from the um, EdJoin website is really gonna help um, recruit and retain um, those people who are looking for a little bit of financial security. Um, and um, I'm really excited about this exciting recruitment tool. Um, let's go back to Jen. And why don't you talk a little bit about the future, what you see as the future of the partnership, Jen? So this is in a pilot phase. Um, we are working back and forth uh, between CalPERS, CalSTRS, and EdJoin. Um, pretty soon we'll have that link available on all of the certificated positions, um, the job postings, and um, we are always looking for feedback. So if there are lesson modules that we don't currently have, certain topics that come up in your, in your districts from your members, we'd like to know about it and we can entertain creating additional modules for your onboarding, um, as well as uh, just continuing this partnership and adding um, more features to our career pages. So again, feedback is great. We'd love to hear it because you are dealing with our membership um, on a more, uh, permanent basis or a regular basis than we do at CalSTRS. It's, we're a little bit removed. So we do love to hear um, any type of feedback from you. And Jennifer? Uh, same, with, same with CalPERS. We're looking at um, some feedback to see how this works for our employers with the possibility of adding new phases and new content in the future as well. Like I said, we're super um, excited about this partnership and what it affords to our school members. Um, Okay, that wraps up our presentation. Next, next slide, please. Any questions? No questions. It looks like there is a question, but I think that might be for the Jennifers. Um, um, is that it the one that's typed in? I'll go ahead and type it yeah. shortly after this, yes. Okay. Thanks. Um, if there are no further questions, we'll pass it on to Josh Robinson in Stakeholder Relations, who will be talking about EdForum. Thanks very much. Okay, sorry, of course, right when it's my turn, my Zoom crashes. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Josh Robinson. I'm the manager of uh, strategic stakeholder outreach in the uh, Office of Stakeholder Relations. I'm gonna just give you a quick update on the educational forum. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is pretty much actually all I'm going to go over. Uh, we have the Ed Forum coming up in just a couple months. As you can see, it's going to be October 19th and 20th. It will be once again virtual this year. We are hoping to bring back a in-person meeting uh, Ed Forum next year. But this year, it's just going to be a two-day online event. Registration is free. Uh, look out for the email to register. It'll be on August 24th, so just a few weeks away. Um, and to get any information on that, you uh, will have the uh, website address right there on the bottom of the slide. We're going to have all sorts of topics uh, ranging from, you know, very transactional uh, MyCalPERS information all the way up to very in-depth uh, topics like the asset liability management uh, process that we've been going through uh, for a little while that's very kind of top of mind uh, around the office. Uh, I'm sure yours as well. Um, and uh, really, that's uh, that's all I have for you today, not to take up too much time. So I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, we do have a question. All right. Yes. Ramona, 
uh, go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Josh. Is the forum going to be interactive like our um, meeting today, or is it going to be reminiscent of last year's? Uh, you know, I'm actually not uh, positive on that. I believe there's going to be a mix, but uh, we can definitely uh, get back to you on that. Is, is this Ramona? Is that you? It, it is. It is. Hi, Ramona. Nice to hear from you again. Uh, you know, we, I, it's been a while. Uh, yeah, we can definitely get the get that information sent out uh, through Susan's team through and, and David's team uh, out to the group at the end. I can I actually be a mini meeting. Right now, I'm in another meeting right now with the uh, the coordinators of the meeting, so I can get you an answer by the end of the day. Okay, and then are we going to have a listing of the, the sessions? Yes, I'm also, as we speak, working on, on putting stuff together. So we're 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 getting uh, close to being uh, mm -hmm. having all that put together uh, for a, for a full format of the forum. Awesome, Josh. Thank you. Absolutely. Any other questions? Well, it doesn't seem to be any more questions. Thank All you right. very much, Josh. Absolutely, and I'll I'll have a response and I'll send it uh, over to your your team in just the next hour or so. Perfect. That's great. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Next slide, please. So at this time, we're going to ask Renee, Brad, and Christina, and the rest of our panelists who are available to answer your questions. So please submit your questions using either the uh, Q&A box or the raise hand feature. So um, Bill, are there any raised hands right now? Yes, we have, ooh, Lisa. She popped up and then popped out. Ramona, did you have a question for the panel? I do, but it might be a message or a question more for Megan. Um, I had a question on the employer certification process. If an employee is requesting time that surpasses their, say they're wanting to buy um, a service purchase prior to membership, and their dates extend past when they became a member. So as an employer, I don't want to certify that full time base. How do, how, do we, how do we do that? Do we have to just let it time out? Um, you know, I would need to defer to either Christina okay. um, for membership or um, if anybody from our service credit purchase is on I the I think line. Christy, Christy, can you answer that question, please? Christy's from our membership review team. Can, can you, I unmute myself. Um, can you repeat the question again, please? If I have um, an individual who is requesting um, a service purchase for their time prior to membership, mm -hmm. but the dates extend past when they became a membership, so as an employer, I don't want to certify that full time. Um, you, you can adjust those dates. If the date is inaccurate that the employee or member put into the certification request, you can adjust those dates when you go into and just certify the time that is up until they are a member. Okay. Second question, again, on the certification. Mm -hmm. If I have someone who has payroll that has been um, submitted and posted, and then I receive a certification. I'm not sure if it's from um, a CalPERS initiated request or a member request, but I have this same time period for when payroll was posted. Do mm -hmm. I go in and put that same data in and certify that? Now, if you've already submitted the payroll data, you can always reach out to um, CalPERS for us to verify. But if it is a service prior to membership, then that would be, you would just allow that time period to expire um, if it's already been reported through the um, regular this payroll reporting process. And, or you can reach out to us and we can verify what, um, 
what we're seeing in the system as far as what's there for the member already reported. Okay. But you would not resubmit it. No, you would not re-add it into the certification process. Okay, because I don't believe this is like a member um, request for service. It probably was generated for a um, membership review. We may have noticed that the time was um, reported late. So certainly, Ramona, if you have um, a question on a specific um, member or CID, you can reach out to the membership reporting email box or call the contact center and they can um, initiate a review or a, a workflow over to our team, but we can double check that for you. But if it's already been reported, um, through the payroll process, then you should not be re-reporting it into the certification screens because we will, the two items, the service prior to membership request and a membership review come on the same forms. And so there is a column on the um, spreadsheet that you, on the um, UID that you would be able to identify. It'll see SCP, yes or um, SCPN. And so if you see an N there, then that represents um, membership requested the information, but it may have just crossed paths when we requested the information. So we certainly, um, you can reach out to us and we could double check to let you know um, whether or not we need to continue having you report the information or not. Thanks, Christina. You're I just wanted to throw out, Ramona, hi, this is Michelle. If you have any further questions as it relates to the certification process, um, mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of uh, individualized questions that are being asked, and we want to make sure that we understand them thoroughly, what you're, what you're looking at and trying to accomplish. We, you can always, like Christina said, you can reach, Christy said, you can send an email to the reporting box, the membership reporting box, or reach out to directly to Christy or myself, and we can always have a individual individualized call with you and walk you through it and see what you're seeing. Um, you're probably going to get the best customer service if you just reach out to us and our team and we can assist at that point. And that goes for anybody on the on this call that has questions as it relates to the certification process. Thank you. You're very welcome. reaching out to the call center and uh, yeah, they're kind of stumped also. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just reach out to us and we'll take care of you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Okay, we have a call or a question from Lisa. Go ahead, Lisa. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so here's my question. And I have asked this of my account reps over time. We have non-contributory members working for us. They are working full-time in other districts. A lot of it is safety related. And then they come here and do some temporary on-call work for us. We have them recorded as members with us in CalPERS as non-contributory members. I have asked the question about reporting their payroll. Because they're a non-contributory member, there's no PERS contribution from us or the employee. I don't have the ability to report that on my PERS report. So I asked, what am I supposed to do? And I was told I don't need to report their earnings because they're non-contributory. Is that true? Should I be reporting them? How do I report them? Um, I, I, you should be reporting them um, just for the fact that the non-contributory appointment could turn into a contributory appointment. And so if that happened, we would use that. So. When you say you can't report their earnings, can you explain a little bit why you can't report their earnings? Well, what is the coding um, to report a non-contributory member without contributions? How, how are they different? Because when I, I, I guess I'm not being clear here. Um, when you report a member with contributions, there's a, um, it's reported as current month earnings with contributions. How do you report a member without contributions? I have the answer for that one, actually. Um, we have a transaction type. It's called earn period, earn period, no service, no contribution. So when you have, I'm sorry. Okay. Continue. Earned period, no service, no contribution. It's a transaction type. 
So whenever okay. you have a non-contributory member, you use that transaction type and it will allow you to not report the contributions, but um, have the earnings added in there. And like Christina said, it's important because what if that member's um, contributory appointment fell off? This one would just pick it back up and, and we would be able to use that as their, uh, what's reported for their earnings and contributions and service credit. So Brad, again, you, see you said that transaction type earned period, no contribution. Could you repeat earned, that again? It's, yeah, I, I'll put it in the chat too. Um, okay. Earned period, no service, no contribution. No service. Okay. And it's only triggered if you have a non-contributory appointment. So if a person's not set up as non-contributory, you won't even see it. It's hidden. But once you have them, that should be available to you. And that may be some setup on our end in our software as Potentially, well. yes. Potentially, okay. yes. Okay. Or maybe the non-contributory appointment hasn't been set up yet. I know that sometimes there's like, like a, a gap. At least maybe this has been fixed. But I think that there's a gap sometimes where... You, you guys have to submit to us what that appointment is. We do a determination and then determine it's not contributory. So sometimes there'll be a gap in between where That's we haven't got correct. it set up yet. So That's in those correct. cases, you'd have to go retro and do like a prior period adjustment or correct your earned period report to add those back in. Okay. Your team is very, very responsive. And I you it, it's a gap of a few days. So typically okay, it, it can happen good. within that payroll cycle. Um, okay. They're very, very responsive with that. And they come back and tell me whether it's contributory or not contributory, probably within a week. That's awesome. Um, I appreciate okay. that. Yes, I appreciate that too. I've, I've got a good setup with the non-contributory part, but I've had received different information over time on how to report those earnings. And it doesn't, the response of, don't worry about it, doesn't sit well with me. That doesn't make sense. Okay. Yep. I'll, I'll post that in the chat when I figure out how to do it. <laughs> the, the name of the <laughs> transaction type. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. And I would also add that it's really important that non-contributories um, are reported and that we are aware of them because they can become a factor when someone goes to retire. If they don't understand that they need to be separated from all appointments, um, it can cause issues with um, their retirement being invalidated. So it's really important that CalPERS knows about all of those so that um, if there's any education gaps with our members and understanding that, that would trigger us to be responding to it. Gotcha. Okay, we have a question from Jenny. Jenny? see, Jenny, uh, go ahead and unmute your microphone. Okay, uh, let's go with uh, Vina. Vina, go ahead. Hi, this is in regards to the non-contributory appointments, and we have quite a few of them. I wanted to know, and I know I asked that in the past too, if we can submit a file to create that non-service, non-contributory appointments, let's say 100, 150 people? Hi, I'm sorry, Vina. can you repeat the, can you repeat that question? Okay, um, it's about the non-contributory appointments. Uh -huh. We have maybe 100, 150, I'm just giving a rough number. I wanted to know, can I submit a file with all those names and have PERS uh, establish a line for the non-contributory appointment? Okay, I'm gonna defer this because that's a payroll, that would be a payroll issue um, with the payroll reporting that. Um, so I don't know, Brad, if you wanna chime in. Um. You're, are you talking about the enrollment part of it or the actual payroll reporting part of it? Actual, actual payroll reporting. But in order to report the payroll, first I, my understanding is I have to establish in your system no service, you know, non contract right. appointment. So I'm asking, can I submit a Excel file? Um. 
you know, I'll probably have to take that back. I, I would say no, because that would be kind of a process no, outside the system that would be manual. Don't say no. We need help. Okay, well, I'll, I'll take that back and explore this option. But <laughs> um, initially, I'm going to say no, but um, we'll, we'll look into it. You know, it's one of those things we need to have that appointment set up first in order for it to pull. So yes. all you would be doing is sending the Excel data to us. And, and normally, CalPERS will not create or post data for employers. So even if you sent that spreadsheet to us, we'd have to send it back to you to actually end up keying it. If that makes sense. No, it does, but I just need a better way of handling it than because it keeps getting postponed because we have quite a few while we submit three, four, and then wait, and then the project gets put aside. I mean, so I was hoping I can submit in one shot. Well, but actually, um, I was going to also say, Vina, you can take an Excel spreadsheet and you can convert it to XML that could then be put into an adjustment file and sent to us. So you, your IT team should be able to convert that Excel file into XML. Okay, so I, want, thank I, would you. I would check with your own IT team. They should be okay. able to do that. Okay, Renee, thank you. I think I understand what you're saying is to send the enrollment file through our if, IT as XML. If you don't have them enrolled, then yes, you would need to um, you would need to utilize whatever path that you utilize currently for enrollment, whether that's um, submission of um, uh, an FTB file or manual keying, whatever path it is. If you don't have the enrollment established, you would need to do that first. Okay. Because my understanding was that first uh, PERS reviews it before it can be created. That's why. True. Yeah, that, that is true. We, we have to review to ensure it's a you know, valid appointment first before we can flip the switch right. on and not contribute. That's right. why I thought we cannot submit the enrollment on our own till you approve it. You can you can submit it. It'll go into the system as an non-contributory appointment, and then you can still report it. Okay, we'll give we'll try it. Okay. Thank you. Thank uh -huh. you. Okay, uh, Monica, you have another question? Uh, yeah. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Cool. Yes. yes okay. So good. We can hear you. Um, I just wanted to tag on to this um, non-contributory thing because it is a huge process for us as well. Um, so I just wanted to clarify too, it's my understanding that um, we put we always put the appointments on there for the non-contributory onto the CalPERS database because we manually enter those appointments on there. And then it's my understanding that CalPERS is the one that designates it as non-contributory. Is that correct? because we don't have the ability to do that here at the county office, right? Yes, that is correct. So we'll review the appointment and then yes, and then we'll mark it as non-contributory. The appointment okay. will stay in the system. So again, if something happens like with that first appointment, the contributory one and um, the non-contributory right. one, right? We'll flip it if it becomes a contributory position, but yes, we'll mark it in our system. So you just report it and then we'll mark it as non-contributory. Okay, so it, it is a huge process for us as well. We have Escape, and for any of you other people out there that might use, you might use Escape if you have a better way of doing it, let me know. Um, because we only have two designations, member, non-member. We don't have non-contributory. So the process that we've come up with to try and do this is to designate those earnings as non-member and then in what we call it, a, a, and then in our interim file before we submit to PERS, we in, designate in that interim file then as, as a member, but without contributions. And then it goes up to the PERS database, but then the PERS database kicks it back in when I submit my final file because it doesn't know where to put this money for whatever reason. And so I end up having to make like 37 to 40 corrections within my file. I've got all these errors and all I'm doing is I'm going in there and clicking on no contributions and then the appropriate district. And so the, the, the system for some reason can't associate these non-contributory earnings with the appropriate district. Um, would there be any way that you guys can make an enhancement 
in that, that when we submit these earnings to you guys, um, I guess that they are going in with a transaction type that is like prior period or current period because we don't have the ability to put in our payroll that transaction type of no contributions. So uh, would there be a way that uh, we might be able to work with you guys in, in somehow making that happen between our system and your system so that I'm not having to go in there and manually make these corrections every single month because every single month we have non-contributory uh, earnings and every single month I have to go in there and click on the district and click on the transaction type of no contributions and then I save and move on to the next error. So <laughs> hopefully you guys could maybe um, let me know about that or is that something we can yeah. research I can, together? <laughs> I can take that offline and talk to our payroll team about it. Um, I can't promise that we'll have any enhancements, but we'll definitely um, offline, we'll definitely talk about that and I'll follow up with you. That would be great. Yeah. And let okay. me know whatever information you need from me, let me know because okay. it's, it's, it's just going to get bigger, you know? So um, obviously we want to be in compliance with you guys. We want to report these, but you know, if we can do it in a more efficient way, that would be great. Awesome. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay. We have a question from Monica. Monica, go ahead. Bill, I think it was Monica that was just speaking. So I think she's, I'm yeah, gonna- I'm Ramona, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. That's okay. I, I'd like to revisit, I, I'm still back up on the certification request. So a few of our districts have been told by uh, the CalPERS call center that some of those certification requests are being initiated by CalPERS as um, random audits of data that's being submitted through the payroll reporting process. Is this true? And if so, could we discuss this and the impact that it has on the staff at the districts and the county level trying to um, supply all that additional information? Because here at the county, we were not aware that they were going to um, do random requests for information. And this was told by more than one of our districts that they were going to be increasing those requests. I have not I can, heard of an audit. I don't, oh, Christy, do you wanna chime in? I, I can take that. That's a definite no. We're definitely okay. not gonna be requesting information just because, <laughs> certainly not in membership. And if you by chance can recall, um, you know, we certainly want to work with the contact center if that's the information they're providing. Certainly not memberships and when membership plus the data, it's because we do not have the data in the system. So we are definitely not going to request additional work output from you or any of the other employers on this call um, because we want to you. audit your system. <laughs> so right. if you want to reach, if if you do have particular concerns on um on contacts that you've had with the the um contact center just let us know because we will definitely work with them to ensure that that's not what's being relayed relative to membership now i can't comment on audit findings but that certainly is not anything that's ever been discussed with membership so um definitely be rest assured that we won't be asking you for that information unless we do find a discrepancy in an appointment history or a member's account. Okay, had it just been one district, I would have just dismissed it as they misunderstood, but I have had at least two districts state the call center told them that they're just randomly <laughs> yeah, no. verification what's submitted. No. And I was like, are you kidding me? That's a definite no. <laughs> yeah, and we'll, we'll look into that to Ramona and see where that's originating from or where it's coming okay. from. So um, we can prevent that information from being that incorrect information from being communicated. Okay. So I had not we'll heard it directly that. from the call center. Like I said, I'm getting it from my districts who have called because when they've called me on needing assistance because this process is so new, I am not a big help. I've instructed them, you're going to have to call the call center to help you get through it. 
So then they're calling me and telling me this is what they're being told. <laughs> and like, you know, and like Michelle had mentioned earlier, if you have questions about the certification, feel free to email our membership reporting box okay. um, to go around that call center so that um, somebody directly, it'll save time and then somebody directly from our team can respond um, to your question correctly. <laughs> okay. And then I wanted to revisit also about the appointments that get um, separated automatically through the, the new process that started last year um, about this time. We were told at that time, I thought that if they were automatically separated and then they worked again, we needed to um, create new appointments. So that's what we had instructed our districts. But we have been told by the call center a few times again that we need to just separate the existing or it remove that existing separation. Because for us, those individuals are substitute on call and they may go six, seven, eight months in between working, depending on whatever reason. So they're still employed by the district. So there wasn't really a separation. They're not on leave. So we wouldn't put them on leave. They just have either not been needed or they were unavailable on the days that they were called in to come work. So would we just remove the separation? That would be the easiest for us. I thought that we were told we could not do that. Hey, Ramona. Um, so, it, I mean, it truly depends on where they are with the situation. So, um, it, it's it's not something you just rant, you can answer that covers all scenarios. Right. So, if the true scenario is they continue to be with you, but they haven't worked, um, then removing that date and then putting it in is the correct way to go. So, um, but if you, if the intention was that they left and then they came back, then it should be a new appointment. So it should truly reflect. The reason why they're separated is because of the potential issues it causes for a class Protect. for a determination. So- Oh you, no, I understand. I, I do, yeah. I, I understand what the reasoning behind it was. Uh-huh. <sighs> As yeah, far so as it really comes months. down to the actual scenario. So okay. the, if the scenario is that they are with you, although, you know, I would ask if it's two or three, because we received the question two or three years down the road, I'm just going to use them again. Would okay. you really not do anything and just bring them back after two years of them not being around, not seeing, would you do any other paperwork? Because if you would, then that would be your trigger to see it as a new appointment, okay. if that makes sense. So it it, it, it's really based on um, the situation of the, um, the agency and the scenario that is taking place. Now, remember, if you are removing that date, then you would need to be zeroing out, confirming zero payroll, right? right. Um, that would be something you would have to do if you're removing that. We had ran into a situation where, um, because they're paid by time card a month behind, and then when we discovered that um, we were submitting our file and it was they didn't have an appointment, it put them into uh, the 90 days. So a late appointment is what triggered this issue because we've instructed you had to create new appointments each time. And I think in, in generally, if, if that's the situation that the, um, the entity has or the school district has and that they're bringing them back after a long period and um, they are going through a rehire process, um, then that would be appropriate. Okay. And then, 
Yeah, and then also if you do run into something where you're getting a late appointment notification because of a situation where a, a um, separation was automatically added, um, reach out to membership so that we can um, look at the appointment history and ensure that if there, um, you know, we can either cancel the arrears determination if it was automatic um, or at least this issue through that process. So um, certainly in, in, in cases like that, we can be of help if you get a notification and it's because the automated um, separation was applied to the member's account. Thank you. Okay. Hey, Christy, could you please um, give us yes. the give us the email address for that mailbox? Did you want me to type that in Q and A or chat? Because I can type it. It's membership underscore reporting at calpers.ca.gov. Yeah, and you can put that in chat too. That'd be okay. Great. Thank I can you do so that. much. Yep. Okay, we have uh, Lisa. Lisa, go ahead. Hi, I just wanted to add in there, I think it was Monica who was speaking about the non-contributory and that they're using escape in, on her end. We are also using escape. So maybe if there's a conversation with, um, was it Christina? If there's a conversation with CalPERS about the reporting, because it sounds like the problem, and that might've been it, the case previously, the problem was getting the information reported to PERS, the report won't accept the data. And there's all this manual entering that we have to do. And we have quite a few non-contributory people. So if there's a conversation with the other school district and all of us are, all of us, the two of us are using escape and, and we need some help with PERS, I just wanted to mention that we're in escape and we'd like to be part of that conversation. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you. Okay, Arlene, we have a question from Arlene, go ahead. Hi, yes, this goes back to the late appointment the, um, they had been talking about the 90 days and whether you create the appointment or you remove the separation date. And of course, you know, I get it, it would be like a case by case. And our recent, um, we actually went through an instance like this not too long ago and I went ahead and created the new appointment, but then shortly after there was an employer certification that popped in there for the same period for this employee. So I'm not sure if the disconnect comes from when the appointment was created and then why is it that there's an employer certification that comes in for that same employee? In that and this is Christine membership. In that case, it may have just been timing. We may have had an inquiry on um, the member's account. And if we noticed the pay wasn't reported or was reported um, not timely, then we would make that request. But certainly um, if you have that occur, you can reach out to the membership reporting box and you can certainly, um, we can certainly um, work with getting the um, certification request um, canceled. Okay. Okay. Great. That, yep. That's what we're looking for. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, and it, please make sure that you all note that that non-contributory appointment has to be set up first or the issue will just keep happening regarding the non-contributory appointments. Okay, we have another question from Monica. Yeah, hi. Um, I just wanted to um, make sure in regards to the purchase service credits again too, um, an email had come out before, uh, just a little while ago, about enhancements to this purchase service credit estimator that the, the um, employees have access to, so they can go on their own, make you know, in their own account, they can put in the information and determine whether or not it's feasible for them to purchase a service credit. Is that still going to be available to the employees, or is that going to be changed in any way? Do you guys know about that? Because um, I'll give you a little bit of background here for us. Um, I did like a, a, an informal poll of my districts to find out, okay, of all of these um, service credit purchase MEM 1344s that you filled out back in the olden days before it was all online, um, about how many of these did you do? And out of them all, I said like 100, 150, whatever, in just the space of one year. And I looked online and out for that one year that we looked at, there were two people 
that ended up choosing to purchase service credit out of like 100, 150 MEM 1344s that were sent in. I mean, it was it was crazy, crazy big. So what, what the districts have kind of decided to do is they're going to direct their employees to this purchase service credit estimator so that they can determine whether or not it's something they wanna pursue before the district has to put in all of the time that it takes to enter all of this information online month by month by month by month, you know, whether or not they're this title, that title, this date, that date, correct this date, correct that date. So I want to make sure that that purchase service credit estimator is still going to be available to all of the employees so that they can make that determination on their own. So is that still going to be available? Um, yes, it is. We don't have anybody here from service credit, I don't think, but um... As far as the latest I've heard on that, then yes, it is will still be available to employees. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And I'll add on to that, Monica. That's one of the reasons why we wanted, um, we as an organization wanted those estimators on there was to try and minimize the work because, you know, it's not just the school districts that have all that work, but we devote a lot of time to those in creating these packages and doing, you have to do all this extra work and then that creates its work in CalPERS. And we have such low numbers in terms of requests actually being elected. And that was right. one of those reasons for that was that right. for people to, and a lot of times they would do shopping. So even though you may only submit <laughs> the information once, yeah. they would submit a request to us and they go, oh my gosh, that's too much. Okay, let me submit it again for right. a few, you know, for instead of for four years, I'm going to submit it for three years. And military is a great, you know, is a great one. And then, right. oh, that's too much. Hold on. Let me do it for two years. Oh, okay. No, I think I could do one year. Let me, and so we would create four packages, but actually, you know, we'd only have one picked or they do all four and they go, oh no, that's still too much. Never mind. I'm not going to elect anything. And wow. so that, that really went, and so we do all four packages for nothing. So you do the work once we do the work four times, still wow. nothing. And so that was the reason why we wanted to go to this was to really drive, um, drive it back to that decision maker to say, oh yeah, this is, this is in the ballpark of what I want. Okay. Like, yep, I want to do it. So that's what we're hoping. It will really drive up the percentages of request to election. That's great. And I love that estimator. Thanks for making that available. I think that's going to save the districts and you guys a lot of time. I agreed. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Okay. Uh, it's like one more question. Deanna, do you have a question? Deanna? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Great. In regards to those service credit requests, the member requests, um, I recently received one for one of my districts, I'm not sure which, but I can't locate the member in my system because I can't find the name. Is there any potential um, enhancements where maybe we could see the um, member's social security number on the request so that we can check our system by social to see if maybe their name has changed since their request? Yes, Michelle. I'm sorry, I'm gonna defer this one to you. Um, yes, thank you, Christina. Um, there, we unfortunately were not going to put a social security field in there. Um, so we can't do that, but we are making enhancements to the tool that allows for them to put in their phone number and their email address of a way to contact that member that's making the request for the employer to reach out to obtain that information. There's also the search tool, of course, in, in CalPERS that you can search them, but if you don't have the social, that makes it difficult. Um, but that is available if you um, can utilize that tool. But unfortunately, that's what we have so far. Um, you can, um, until that enhancement is put in, um, that can help you find who that member is. You can call the contact center. They may be able to assist, but again, they won't be able to provide the social security number. 
Yeah, when I called in, they weren't able to assist me because I couldn't verify the member in any way because I can't bring them up. So they they advised me to just let the, the request time out. Um, yeah, unfortunately, at this time, unless the member reaches out to the employer and um, tells them who they are, it, it does make your job a little bit difficult trying to tie the two together. Um, so I know they're working on, um, it's actually an upcoming release that service credit purchase team has in the hopper that will help aid in um, that relationship and getting those completed. Okay, great. Thank you. You're very welcome. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Are there any other raised hands, Bill? No, that's all. Okay, good. Well, this has been a great webinar. Um, so we do want to be respectful of your time. We know you have um, CalSTRS right after this. Um, if you think of any questions um, after we end the webinar, please feel free to send those to the CalPERS CAC mailbox. Can I have one little plug before we quit? You sure can. Okay. Um, so I just recently sent an email out on Monday to all of you about the webinar I want to set up for our new business rules for payroll for the special compensation items. If you guys recall, there was that rollout we did and I think it was like late April, early May, and we jammed up your payroll because we, we aired out a bunch of special comp items that were, you know, highly reported. So you know, we eased the mm -hmm. rules, we turned it on to an exception, but you know, the time has come that we're going to start digging into that and learning um, what are those proper thresholds, you know, and the main reason we want that in there is we want to prevent things like lump sums from, from reporting or other items that may have just been misreported or, you know, lumped together, whatever the issue might be. So um, I'm going to be setting that up probably um, at towards the end of September. I've already gotten about 50 to 60 responses. So thank you on that. Um, so looking forward to that. And if you are interested and you didn't receive that email, go ahead and shoot me one now. Uh, my name's brad.hansen at calpers.ca.gov. And that's not my name, actually. It's my email address. So um, that was just a little, that's live television for you, if you will. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Brad. I uh, also wanted to let you know that we're going to be sending out a report um, probably later this week, and I'll show you all the written questions and answers that went along with that. And I wanted to remind you also that we you'll get a survey right after this webinar, and we encourage you to complete and submit that survey. And as I mentioned, the webinar will be available probably at the end of this week or early next week on our website. And I just wanted to thank our presentation team for passing along all their valuable information and a big thank you to you, our school employers, for your questions and comments. CalSTRS will be hosting the afternoon session um, of the Employer Advisory Committee meeting at 1230 and you can log on to the CalSTRS website to join that meeting. So again, we do appreciate your time today. So thank you again and have a great afternoon. Thank you, everybody.